Good morning. Welcome this morning. Um, I don't know if you know this about me or not, but I love to bake. And I love to try new things. I love to try new recipes. I even love to alter recipes. My family laughs at me because I have discovered the Great British Baking Show. And there are a lot of seasons, and it's so much fun, and I get so many ideas. And so Christmas time, uh, we are coming up to the time where I am actually looking at my calendar thinking, okay, what three days, three days, can I block off to just do my Christmas baking? It's fudges, cookies, dipped um, lemon peels, like I just, candies, I just, oh, I love this time of year. And so in thinking of this sermon, um, I... <laughs> I thought of a time when I was caught up in a recipe that I was trying. I had tried, I've tried so many waffle recipes. I'm seriously, if anybody has a really good homemade waffle recipe, I'm open to it. Um, I've tried so many different recipes, and this one recipe called for three sticks of butter in it. And I thought, that's ridiculous. So, I mean, could be amazing, <laughs> absolutely. But I was feeling a little bit guilty about even presenting this to my family, let alone asking them to consume it. So I put the butter in half, and I made this waffle recipe. And it was, it was okay. And they're kind of used to me kind of trying some things. And so like, yeah, no, you know, maybe keep working, but it's okay. And so in the tasting of that, these waffles tasted almost like donuts, um, they, were, they were cakey, and yet they were kind of soft. They didn't crisp, though, and so I thought, okay, so maybe it does need a little bit more butter, but I'm not really happy with them as waffles. So I got caught up in changing this recipe, and I thought, I'm going to make them as muffins instead. We'll call them box breakfast muffins, and they'll taste kind of like donuts, kind of like waffles, and so I'll add a couple more eggs and, you know, help them poof up a little bit more. And I got so caught up in this, and I, I realized that when I made the waffles, it was a small little bowl, so I clearly have to double it to be able to make the muffin tin that I needed. So I doubled the recipe, and I was so caught up in my excitement of what I'm going to present to my family and this new amazing thing that I'm going to create that everyone's going to think, oh, can I have that recipe? This is so good. So I was so caught up in all of these thoughts and feelings. I put it in the oven. My daughter's in the kitchen with me, and we're all like, oh, this is so much fun. And I bake them, and the timer goes off, and the house is smelling so good. And I open up the door, and I pull out the pan, and I don't know what happened. They didn't poof, but they expanded, and they kind of were this goop. Like, they never really cooked, and they were this goop that just, you know how the muffin tins have the circles that are filled? You couldn't see the circles. It was the whole entire sheet pan, but it was like bubbling, and the edges were crystallized, and it still looked wet. And I thought, what in the world happened? So I pulled them out and thought, let's at least, you know how you can tap them sometimes or see if they're almost done? They were cooked, but they were looking wet. Like, it was all one solid mass. And I realized, wait a second. I doubled the sugar and I doubled the butter, I didn't double anything else. And it was just this bubbly, like, it literally took me four days of off and on soaking and scrubbing to get that pan clean. It was absolutely horrible. And I'm, I'm glad I'm, <laughs> I'm not asking you to share any stories because I don't want you to feel <laughs> the way I feel about my amazing story I just made public. But there's a young lady that I found a video clip of who also appears to understand of getting caught up in something you're so excited that you actually miss the pretty important parts. So if we could show that clip, please. Todavía. Tienes que saludar primero. Saluda, párate, párate, párate. Dale. Pie 
<laughs> and she got it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. So sometimes we can get so caught up in the do's, the don'ts, the shoulds, the shouldn'ts that we completely miss the whole point. I got so caught up in my muffin concoctions and everything that I totally missed the ingredients that I actually needed in it. And sometimes that happens in our life. If we have a promotion that we are going for and we get so caught up in what is needed that we might miss how it's affecting those around us or how we are affecting with our attitude those around us. Sometimes we might have a spouse that we, we see changes in them that should happen and so we get co so focused on trying to help them make those changes or pointing those things out that we miss, that we need to encourage and love and empower them and build them up. We get so caught up in sometimes trying to make friends that we, we maybe compromise what we like or don't like or should or shouldn't do. It's so easy to get caught up. And the passage we're going to be looking at, if you want to turn to it now in preparation, we're not going to get there quite yet, but it'll be in John chapter 1. So if you want to find John chapter 1, we'll get there in just a moment while you're looking that up. But in John chapter 1, we come into a, a part of the story where <laughs> really I feel like it's a whole buildup of scripture and history up to this point. God created everything, and God was there with his creation. He was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. He declared everything good, and his presence was with them. And then sin entered. Their self-control of saying, no, my way, not God's way. What I want, not what God wants. And they made that choice that changed everything. And because of that, they were put away from God's presence. Their choice chose a different path. And so from that point on, we see God choosing a man named Abraham. And when he chose Abraham, he declared to Abraham, you are going to become a great nation, and you will be my people, and I will be your God, and I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. Bless you to be a blessing is actually interpreted in the Hebrew language as you are blessed, and you are a blessing, and I am with you in all of that. It's all stemming from God. And so this promise to Abraham is all of God's presence being with them. And then you can be, and I can be with you, and everyone will see. But they didn't always live up to this promise. Abraham's descendants, um, God fulfilled the, or made the promise again to his son Isaac, and then to his Isaac's son Jacob. And we see in Jacob that they didn't always live up to what they should be to be a blessing. Jacob we see as being, um, he lies, he tricks, he manipulates things to try to get his own, own way. And it doesn't always go very well. And the people continued as they were growing as a people to make these kinds of choices. And to not really be the model of God's love that God wanted them to be, to be a blessing. They ended up becoming slaves in Egypt, and after 400 years, God frees them from that. And as they're coming out of the being slaves, God says and renews this promise, I will be your God, you will be my people, I will bless you, you will be a blessing, my presence will be with you. And then as they are going and through the desert, through the wilderness, to become a nation, to be finding the special place where God says, there is where you will be my people. Their fear becomes so strong that they miss God's promise. 
they begin to think of things within their own resources or their own capabilities, if they're good enough to be able to be God's people, if they would be able to be able to be in this land God is going to be giving them. And when they finally make it to the land, instead of thinking, okay, God is with us, his presence very real and cloud and fire was with them, they had heard and seen him on a mountain in thunder and lightning and trumpets. They make it to the promised land, and all they see is their fear. All they see is their incapability of not good enough. And they say, we can't. And they refused to enter into God's promise. They finally, after many, many years, come back. They enter into this land. They become a people. And instead of being God's people, following God's presence, seeking God's wisdom on things that they are supposed to do, they start to think, well, they don't, and they live in a different way. And so they started doing what other nations did, and they followed gods that other nations followed, and they totally walked away from God's presence. They had a symbol there in their community, in their nation, of a temple, and this temple was where God's presence was, and it's where they would go to meet God's presence. And when they were conquered by other nations because of their choices of walking away from God and choosing other things, as they were conquered in their minds and in their belief, God's presence had left them. And as they're scattered throughout other nations and all these conquering places that come into them, they believe that God's presence is no longer there with them, they will not see him again, and they have total despair that God has left them. But through the voices of prophets, prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah declare to them, yes, you are away from what you should be. But God's presence through visions and, and words that they had and declared, they declared God's presence is with you, even if you're not by the temple. God will bring you back to him, back to being his people. He will be with you. You will be his people. You are blessed. You will be a blessing. All of this, they reiterated the promise. And they said, this will come in the form of one from God, an anointed one. And the word that they ended up using to describe this one who would come, this one who would be God's presence with them again, was Messiah. And so they are longing for this. And where we're going to, in just a minute, pick up the story, is they have this longing. It seems despairing. They are, they're oppressed again. Now it's by the Roman Empire. People are telling them what they can and cannot do. And we have a group of people called the Pharisees that are like, okay, if God is going to be with us, then we need to make sure we're good enough. We need to make sure that we're doing the right things, saying the right things, not doing what we shouldn't do. Like it, it's all in our, in our capability of what we are letting God do. So we need to be good enough. So to be good enough, we need to follow all of these rules. And we need to watch each other and make sure each other is following all of these rules too. Because only when we're good enough is when God's presence is going to be back with us. So they hit it pretty hard. And they were really, really watchful and oppressive themselves in making sure everyone was good enough. There's another group called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were very learned, just like the Pharisees, in, in God's word and, and what he has declared to his people and how he wants them to be. But the form they took was, we're going to be God's people, but we are here. So we're going to work and be compatible with the culture that we're in. So maybe it'll look a little bit different. We want to make sure we're working with them and that they like us and that we're okay with them. So it caused them to sometimes compromise the things that, that God's word may have said. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees would fight with each other. There's another group of people called the Essenes. And the Essenes, their way of looking at God's presence to be back with them was, we don't want to get tainted or contaminated by any of the beliefs and thoughts and things going on around us. So we're just going to withdraw away, just be us, live God's way, and we're going to hope and pray that God does away with all of everybody else, and it's just going to be us. So they lived very withdrawn and just them, and they didn't try to interact much with other people. And then there's a man named John the Baptist. And he got this title because he did baptize people. And how John was teaching was 
God's presence is coming, and we are to get ready for him, not by following rules, not by withdrawing away, not by trying to become just like everybody else around us and, and maybe not talk God too much. Instead of that, we need to repent. We need to say, God, we have done wrong. We have not lived your way. Forgive us. And so John was more of a preparer. He was somebody who was kind of um, laying the groundwork and getting everybody ready because he was teaching and, and he believed God's presence was near. He was coming, so let's get ready. And in his teaching, Jesus was alive. Jesus was walking around. And there was one day where John saw him and he says, there, that is the Lamb of God. That was another phrase for the Messiah, the one who would come and would save the people. And so some of his followers believed. And where we are going to pick up in verse 43, one of his followers, Andrew, had found Jesus and had said, I'm, I believe you are the one. John has mentioned it. I, I, I want to follow you. I want to learn from you. And he told his brother Simon. And so they're following. And then here is where we pick up in verse 43. John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. There are some names in here that we find. Philip, for the first time we find him. There's not a whole lot in the Bible about Philip, um, but we do know that he follows Jesus. And he's often the one that will go and talk to others. He doesn't say much. He doesn't have a lot of grand speeches but his heart longs to follow Jesus. And he finds his friend Nathaniel. Nathaniel is somebody who is only mentioned here in Scripture. And this, the passage, the chunk that we are going to be reading today, is really all we know of him. There are some thoughts. Maybe he has gone by a different name in other Gospels. Um, maybe he's referenced to one of the apostles. And we're not really for sure. But what we do know, we learn from Philip about Nathaniel. Philip goes to him and says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. The only reason Philip would go to him with that point is if he knew that point was important to Nathaniel. So in the midst of all of this longing and all the groups of people trying to figure out their, their way and, and how God is going to be with them again and how to be God's people, Philip knows Nathaniel is longing. And Nathaniel is not just wishing and hoping, but Nathaniel is studying and learning. He knows about Moses and what Moses has written about. He knows about the law and how God wants his people to be so that they can be in the world and be a blessing. He knows what the prophets have said, that God's presence will return and you will be my people. I will gather you. Nathaniel knows all of this and his heart is yearning for it so much that Philip, as soon as he meets Jesus the next day, I got to go find Nathaniel. So we know Nathaniel's heart is in deep longing at this point. We're going to continue on in verse 46 and 47. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel's response, some think maybe he is being like, ugh, Nazareth, that's a nasty, horrible place. But many in looking at it think, because Nathaniel knows about Moses, knows about the law, knows about the prophets, he knows the prophecies, the words that were declared of this Messiah, who he would be, what he would be like, where he would come from. And so knowing this, Nazareth is not mentioned in those prophecies. So Nathaniel's question is not necessarily, you, Nazareth. It's more of a, Naz it'd be kind of like if I told you, I'm from Ovid. And you'd be like, Ovid? Where's that? Never heard of it. That's Nathaniel's response. Nazareth? And then when he says, can anything good come from there? He's referencing the goodness of God. He is referencing, but that's not in the prophecies. That's, can, can anything of God come from there? He's not disparaging the people. 
he's surprised, but that's not a prophecy. And then Jesus sees Nathanael, and I love Jesus' response to Nathanael. He says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. The word Israelite in the book of John is only used here. Otherwise, John references the Jews or um, the Jewish people. This is the only place that that word is used. And that word was declared of Jacob way back when God had made the promise to Abraham, you will be my people and I will make you into a nation. And then Abraham's son Isaac and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name is Jacob and it means he who grabs the heel which was a term of deceit. It was a term saying you don't get it by earning it, you get it from taking or from using other people, using them to your advantage. Romans 16 mentions deceit as being um, serving one's appetite. So this whole concept of being an Israelite is referencing Jacob. When Jacob was wrestling with God very literally because of a difficult situation he was in, he held on and he said, tell me your name. And God wrestling with him, we find out later it was God, does not give his name. And finally Jacob declares, give me your name. And God ends up giving Jacob a new name. He says, you will be called Israel because you have overcome with God. Meaning you have held on to God's presence, and you have made it through. So when Jesus says, here truly is an Israelite, Jesus is declaring back to Nathaniel what had been and wasn't able to be lived out. Your heart is living it out. You are seeking God. You are longing for God's way. You are trying to live God's way. He is basically restoring Nathaniel to what had been declared of Jacob and Jacob's people. And then we see, as we continue in verse 48, How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. When Nathanael asked Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus gives such a strange answer. I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathanael's response is, oh! It could very well be, literally, that Jesus, through divineness of him being fully God and fully human, saw Nathanael sitting under a fig tree. But more likely, what scholars are finding, this term of being under a fig tree is a term that is used of being in a place of study and seeking and a personal time with God which fits better with Nathaniel's response. When he suddenly goes from, who are you, how do you know me, to Rabbi, you are the Son of God, declaring him, you are the one. Jesus saw him, saw his heart as being one of seeking. Jesus references a time for Nathaniel when it was just Nathaniel and God. When it was just a personal time, it, it'd be kind of like if you came up to see me and said, hey, a couple weeks ago I saw you sobbing very ugly in your bedroom as you prayed to the Lord. That would be that type of a revelation. How did you know that I was doing that? When you have that personal time with God, when no one is around, nobody sees, it's just you and God, you are very real, very raw, very honest and open to God, seeking him that's what Jesus saw of Nathaniel. And Nathaniel knows at that point, there is no way that you knew I was, I'm going to say sobbing ugly, I know that's not a word, in the bedroom. But it's that type of a reference. You are God, because only God knows what God and I saw, talked about, and, and experienced. Only God knows that, so you are God. He declares him rabbi, which means teacher. Only disciples would declare this, meaning you are my teacher. 
You are the one I am wanting to learn from and will follow and will try to be like. And then he calls him son of God, which was only referred to but in prophecy as the one who was anointed and would be God's presence with his people. And then Jesus says, you believe because I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. And it's kind of like, <laughs> have you ever prayed and asked God to just show you? Or if somebody says this, then I know I'm supposed to do this. Or we have certain um, expectations that we hope for that if that happens, then I know what God wants me to do. Or then I know what I should say or how to handle that situation. Jesus tells him, you are amazed by that. He doesn't say it's not amazing. Yeah, sure, it's very amazing. But you are going to see so many greater things. It's kind of like me with my baking and the little girl doing her video or trying to do her taekwondo. Y you saw that you were able to break that, that little board, but there's so much more that you are going to see and experience. This is so much bigger than me just telling you I saw you under the fig tree. There is so much more to this. Sometimes when we get caught up, when I'm caught up in so many things in my head or so many things I'm trying to do right and make sure that I get the way I should have them be and I get so caught up that I miss, and this sounds silly, I miss it's more about more than just me. It's not just my experience that God is here for. Yes, he loves me. Yes, he sees Philip under the fig tree. Yes, he knows Philip is a true Israelite. He knows his heart. But there's so much more to this. And we're going to keep going. We're going to finish up in verse 51. He being Jesus, then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Seems kind of strange to have responded that way. Um, it seems kind of code. I don't know if you've ever, um, way back in my childhood, I remember there being superheroes who would give these words of wisdom, and the wind blows because it blows the wind. And you would hear these weird things, and you're like, I have no clue what that means, but I'm going to act like I do. This seems kind of like a weird thing. You will see heaven open and angels ascending and descending. Okay. And so Nathaniel, we're not for sure what his response is, but here's what Jesus is talking about. It's not just some weird phrase that you have to be special to know the meaning of. It's in scripture. When Jesus referenced um, Nathaniel as a true Israelite, that went back to Jacob. Our understanding of this also goes back to Jacob. Jacob, at one point in his life, when he was running from his brother, he had a dream during the night. And this dream was he saw heaven open, he saw a ladder or a stairway from heaven to the earth, and he saw angels going up and down this ladder, up and down this stairway. And he knew that he was seeing an amazing heaven moment, an amazing divine connection between heaven and earth, and he woke up and he declared that place as being the house of God. The name was changed, it was now called Bethel. So everywhere, or he would come back to this point, um, at another point in his life, he came back to Bethel. He came back to reconnect to God and God's presence that he had seen there. When Jesus tells Nathaniel, you will see heaven open, that term right there, heaven open, means heaven having been opened. It has already happened. It has already taken place. Heaven is already opened. And then he references this dream, the angels of God ascending and descending. But here's the difference. On the Son of Man, Jesus is the only one who refers to himself in the book of John as the Son of Man. Anytime we see somebody else using that term for Jesus, they're, they're asking or, or putting his words back to him. Nathaniel called him king. Many were looking for a king to make them back into a great nation. Jesus changes this and says, no, I'm the son of man. I am the one who will come. I am fully God, fully human. I am here with you. And he gives himself this name, taking away all of those expectations that everyone may have had, and says, no, I am God here with you. And the difference from that dream, there's no ladder. There's no stairway. It's on the son of man. 
God's angels, the messengers of God, go up and down on the Son of Man. Jesus is declaring, I am the connection. I am where heaven and earth meet. I am God's message going to the earth and back to heaven. I am the one that makes all of this the house of God. It is me, is what Jesus is declaring. So what does this have to do with us? Got to turn my pages because I got excited and kept going. Nathaniel's encounter with Jesus shows that he does not miss the biggest part. Yes, he was caught up in seeking. Yes, he was caught up in trying to figure out and find when God's presence would be there and how this would be. But God fully saw him, saw his heart, saw his crying, meets him right where he is by recognizing that point and that moment and says, I am here. I am fulfilling all that you have been looking for. It's me. And where we enter into this is actually found in verse 51. When Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here's what it means. That word you, both of the words you, is plural. And the tense that it is used in means you, meaning if Jane and I were having a conversation right now and I say, but you are all invited, it is Jane and it is the whole entire group. Thank you for letting me use you as an example. But the tense this is written in is that plus future. It is a present and a future tense of that word. We are literally talked about in Jesus' words. He's saying, very truly, I tell you, Nathaniel, and you, group of people with Nathaniel and around me listening, and you who will hear of this is what Jesus is saying. So we can actually read that verse like this. Jesus then added, very truly, I tell you, Jane. Very truly, I tell you, Dawn. Very truly, I tell you, Tim. You will see heaven having already been opened and God's message going between heaven and earth through Jesus, in Jesus, and because of Jesus. For he is the one who has been written about, who fulfills all the promises of God's presence that are made not only for his people, but for all the people throughout the world. I can get so caught up in trying to do the right thing. Like all the groups of Israel at Nathaniel's time, I also get caught up in trying to be good enough, making sure I'm saying, doing, being the right thing. That is not what I'm supposed to get caught up in. That is not what you are supposed to get caught up in. And I'm not supposed to withdraw and say I'm not good enough, so I'm not going to become anything that I shouldn't be. I'm going to live in fear and close myself off. That is not what God has called us to. God sees Nathaniel. He sees us crying out. He sees us looking, searching, yearning for the world to be what he has called it to be, to not have to worry about so many things of hurting and being hurt. He sees that. And he calls to each one of us. He says, I see your moments with God. I see your fears. I see your insecurities. I see all of that. And heaven has already been opened. My presence is already here with you. And it's in and through me, Jesus says, that you can be, just be, Instead of getting caught up of the shoulds and shouldn'ts, the do's and the don'ts, the good enoughs, the not good enoughs, Jesus says, be. My presence is here with you. Be who you are. That is good enough. That is what I'm looking for. Jesus tells us, and I absolutely love this, that he sees us, he hears us, and he is with us. And sometimes that can sound like church words, like, okay, that's, how does that help me in my situation that I'm in right now? It makes all the difference because now you don't have to live in fear. Now you don't have to try in your own strength and power. You don't have to worry if your word was the right word or not the right word. You don't have to worry about that. Yes, let's all get better together and try to do what God wants us to do. But what Jesus is saying is his presence is here. 
He is the image of God. He is who God is, who God is declaring us to be. Follow him, learn from him, and now be his image in the world around you. We are called to help people see Jesus, help them see how God connects, how heaven and earth meet in Jesus, and that they are not alone. We are to be his image bearers. If you are a believer in Jesus, this means you are good enough. Keep learning, yes, but you are good enough. Just be God's image of love in the world around you, to your spouse, to your children, to your work colleagues, to the sporting event that you are at. Show God's image of love because Jesus restored that. Jesus reconnected all of that. Just be. Love where you are. Love who you're with. Just be his image bearers in the world around you. And if you are not a believer, what this means are is you are seen. Jesus has healed because of his death on the cross, you have forgiveness for any of those shouldn'ts you shouldn't have done, any of those shoulds that you didn't do. You're forgiven of the hurts that you have caused. You are forgiven. You are restored to his image. And now because of his resurrection from the cross, fully coming back alive again, you are restored to his image and you can live with his love because of Jesus with you. He will help you. His Holy Spirit helps you to learn, grow, and be his presence in the world. So just be. You are good enough. You are able. We're going to close in prayer. And if you would like to come up to the front and kneel and have your fig tree moment here at the altar, you are welcome to come under the fig. <laughs> and you are welcome to have that time with the Lord as we pray. I do ask if you are um, an unbeliever and you are giving your life to the Lord for the first time, please tell somebody you trust, maybe somebody who is next to you, so that we can pray together and we can learn together as we learn and walk this road together. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you. We are a people who know that we need you. We are a people who are longing for the peace that you give, longing for your presence and power and strength in our lives. Lord, we may have a particular need that we are caught up in, and we're seeking to see and not miss the biggest thing that you have for us in that. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you see, that you guide, and also, Lord, that you have already made a way. We don't want to get so caught up in our situations that we miss being your image in the midst of it all. Please be with those who may be declaring you as their Savior and Lord for the first time today. May they be filled with your Holy Spirit as they accept your gift of forgiveness and new life in you. And Lord, may you be with each one of us today. Help us to be your image bearers, filled with your love, not fear. Filled with your love to live it out, not withdraw. And Lord, be with us as we go from here and throughout the rest of this week. May we live your image of love. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to leave you with this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Go in peace.